And I think that's a great introduction, um, a good segue, because uh, I kind of wanted to start off talking about rain gardens in terms of water quality. Um, probably everybody here, I'm going to assume, has a, a landscaping background, either design or construction or maintenance. Um, and kind of how I got into rain gardens is more coming from water quality aspects. Um, so I want to put out a few key terms and concepts out here dealing with the water quality perspective on the rain gardens. Um, you might hear a lot of NPS, which means non-point source, and so that's addressing what, um, you know, we just mentioned the water quality, uh, nutrients, uh, potentially pesticides, but nutrients usually being nitrogen, phosphorus, something that might run off of a lot, uh, might be something that comes off of uh, a lawn. Um, you'll see the acronym BMPs, which means best management practices. Um, so that's a variety of different stormwater means that could either address quantity of stormwater or quality of stormwater. Sometimes they might address both, but sometimes the a BMP might be for one or the other. Usually a rain garden is going to be a water quality um, stormwater practice. Um, there's a few different basic functions of some of these rain gardens and, and um, things of this nature. It's going to do some infiltration. Uh, it might do some filtration, which means, you know, physically removing trash and sediment and things like that. Um, it could do some detention and retention and, and uh, actually a rain garden won't do any retention. Um, I came up with this little detention delays water, retention means it remains. So I, I could never get a detention basin and a retention basin straight in my mind. So that's kind of how I, I um, remember that. Retention will, water will remain in a basin and that's not what a rain garden is. Um, but you might hear terms like bioinfiltration, biodetention, bioretention, all this bio plus whatever. And um, that's all kind of under the umbrella of green infrastructure where rain gardens would kind of fall into this, in this terminology. So that's used a little bit more with engineers and architects or city planning. They might use this term green infrastructure. Um, and that's kind of an umbrella, umbrella term that's talking about, you know, stormwater practices, they're going to be, you know, protecting, restoring, or, or mimicking the natural water cycle. Um, usually the green BMPs offer additional benefits, you know, you get flowers and trees to look at, you get oxygen production, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so what we're pretty much used to in the stormwater realm for the past 50, 100 years are what I call the three C's of stormwater, which is you collect it, you convey it and use a heck of a lot of concrete. Um, so this is a pretty typical approach a lot of communities have been using for how to deal with stormwater. How do you deal with building in an area that might have been a floodplain or might have been a wetland? Um, so it's just about getting the water away as quickly as it can. Well, as our cities have grown, we've changed the landscape. Uh, we're getting more and more impervious surface. So impervious is another key word. Impervious just really means um, preventing water from soaking into the soil. So that could be sidewalks, driveways, parking lots, rooftops, even compacted soil may be considered impervious. So what happens when it rains? Uh, you know, when Daniel Boone came across the, the Cumberland Gap, you know, this was all forested out through here in Kentucky. Um, so we had a lot of natural ground cover. Most of the time, whenever it rained, the water would soak into the ground. There would be some uptake with the plants. You get evapotranspiration. Um, so very little runoff. You see about 10%. So as our communities have grown, we've grown our impervious surface, we're increasing a lot of runoff. Does that make sense? Yeah. And our communities have been growing. The amount of impervious surface has been growing quite a bit. So uh, this was a um, USDA natural resources inventory in 2010 that about 37% of our currently developed areas happened in about 28 years. So that was up to 2010. So I'm sure it's, it's grown a lot since then. So what happens when it rains? So for on an average year, which we haven't had an average year in probably five or 10 years, but an average for Kentucky is about 45 inches of rain in a year. 
So every square foot of impervious surface, that's about 27.9 gallons of runoff a year. So every thousand square feet of impervious surface, that's 27, almost 28,000 gallons of water a year. So that's a lot of water. So a lot of our communities, this is my home watershed. This is a Wolf Run watershed up in, in Lexington. All the red areas are currently developed or per impervious. So we get a lot of runoff. And so where does that water go? Um, probably when this subdivision was built, this was not a creek. It was probably a low dip, grassy dip. But you can see the tree roots, jagged rocks sticking out. Uh, this is eroded away in probably about uh, 20 years, I'd estimate. Where did all the soil go? It went into their pond. So I want to kind of pitch this concept that rain is natural, but stormwater isn't. Um, what we end up with, with all this excessive stormwater that comes off our parking lots and our rooftops and driveways, it's uh, blowing out a lot of our creeks. It's just a lot more water than our creeks grew up, you know, to handle. So uh, especially in Lexington, we get issues with our sanitary sewers along the creeks, and so we get a mixture of that, which is not, not uh, delightful. We get a lot of eroded banks, a lot of erosion where just that big volume of water is coming in and just blowing out a lot of creeks. So we're losing a lot of habitat, too. Uh, this is here in Cove Spring Park here in Frankfurt, um, a big eroded goalie that we worked on there. So what we're doing with the rain gardens, it's we're trying to find a natural kind of remedy of sorts um, to address some of the, the runoff problems that we have. Um, so a rain garden is basically a shallow landscape basin. Um, we want water to infiltrate into the soil. We want to slow it down, spread it out, soak it in, and store that water in a landscape basin. Um, our biggest actual pollutant in Kentucky, we got uh, nutrients and sediment. So people usually think nutrients are a great thing. I mean, we take vitamins, we want nutrients in our body, but in waterways, it's, it's not a good thing. It leads to a lot of algae and a lot of decline in our water quality and sediment too. Um, we get a lot of sediment in Kentucky. So I've got two rain garden rules, and this is, uh, I just made these up. It's not in a book anywhere or anything like that. Um, this is what I use to determine if something is or is not a rain garden. And I say if it collects stormwater runoff, if it infiltrates that water into the soil. So if you've got a basin with some wildflowers out in the field, it may not be getting stormwater runoff. I wouldn't call it a rain garden. It might just be a nice little planted area. Uh, if it's a area that gets a lot of runoff and does not infiltrate, that might be a wetland. I wouldn't call it a rain garden. It's something else. So the key is a good, deep, permeable, organic, rich topsoil. Everybody wants that, right? <laughs> One of the big you know, questions I get or you know, comments is, what about mosquitoes? Because you think about storing water, what about mosquitoes? If you can get a good working rain garden, that's going to drain down in a few days. Um, the mosquito breeding cycle takes seven days for its its life cycle. So if you can get these rain gardens to, to drain down and dry out within a day or up to three or four days, it should eliminate that breeding cycle. Um, so this is a, there we go, this is an image of a project. Uh, I've been pretty lucky so far that usually when I build a rain garden, I get done and it rains. So I've had some good luck uh, just to test stuff out. Um, so this is what it can look like when it fills up and then drains down. And uh, we had some research with the University of Kentucky to measure water fluctuations in the rain garden, make sure it's going down. So the big aspect to rain gardens, what makes a break a rain garden to me is the soil type. Um, you'll want to look at soils, um, maybe a little bit more so than if you were to just be putting in a landscape bed somewhere. The soil type's really going to do a lot of control to how effective that rain garden's going to be. Um, I use county soil maps. I do a lot with the web soil survey. It's something I can do on the computer. Uh, if I get a call or a consultation, I don't have to go to the site necessarily. Um, I might be able to re rely on the web soil survey. Um, and this is a pretty good uh, tool. Um, it's through the USDA NRCS. Um, you can look that up. It will 
It will often tell the soil type, um, sometimes in cities and urban areas that soil type may not be mapped because it might not be a certain soil type, it's probably just all kinds of fill. So you might come across, especially in uh, urban areas where it might be unmapped soil. But for the most part, um, most of inner bluegrass, we do have a lot of good silt loam, which is just the prime stuff for a rain garden. Um, on this uh, web soil survey, it'll give you some information. You'll look at drainage class, you know, usually our silt loams are well drained. Um, a good depth and um, usually don't flood or don't pond water. So that's something you want to look for. Um, and then you want to also see if there's any information on the soil profile. You want to think about how deep the soil layers are. Uh, if you come across bedrock when you're digging your first shovelful, that's probably not going to be a good rain garden spot. Um, I'll often do a soil percolation test. Um, and it's key to remember that if you're digging out a six inch or 12 inch deep rain garden, that first six or 12 inches is what you're going to be taking out. So it doesn't do a lot of good to do a soil percolation test of what's on the surface. It's going to be the, the material that you're going to be building the rain garden in. So um, you might have to dig down a little deeper. But it's good to get to know what kind of material you're, material you're de dealing with. Um, you want to make sure that the rain gardens are going to be built above a water table. So if you're doing a soil percolation test and it's just full of standing water, then that's going to be a good sign that you might be able to do a wetland, you might be able to do a pond, but I wouldn't call it a rain garden. Um, so even if like that was going to be the design elevation of what my, my finished rain garden would be, the surface of it, I'll go ahead and dig down about as far as I can just to see what's going to be controlling that water infiltration. Um, and sometimes you, uh, you don't have the opportunity to do any advanced <laughs> investigations or information might be off and uh, sometimes you don't get a choice and you get in there and, and uh, you get rocked. So you got to do something. Um, so we often will come in and do basically a French drain. Now, is that cheating? I don't know. It's just solving the problem. Um, you might have to do just rely on um, drainage lines, gravel, sand, and things like that to make sure to ensure that that water is going to drain. Um, but you, you can do that. I don't think that's cheating. I'd still consider this a rain garden because I'm getting stormwater coming off of these houses, coming off these roads. I'm using plants and it's infiltrating. So location is another factor to think about, another key element. Um, a lot of times people will want to build rain gardens where they see ponded water. And again, for me, that's not a good indicator for a rain garden site. Um, you don't want to get too close to a building either. Uh, you want to keep in mind if you're starting to redirect water, redirect where it's going to, you don't want to cause any problems, especially like a house with a crawl space or a basement. You want to keep that in mind. Um, call bud. Do that, that can be a big influence on your location, your design, your placement. Um, so this is a little case study I did out in Owensboro. Um, you might get um, you know, some residential folks who want to do a landscape. So typically, uh, we're starting off, I'm looking at the roof, looking at the area that's going to drain to a particular spot, um, kind of taking a look around, see what I got. Oftentimes, like, you know, if there's a downspout, and maybe that, you know, that's a good water source to tap into. Um, but just kind of seeing how much area you got to work with, um, seeing what's around, um, things to pick up on. I see some little vents, so I know that's a crawl space. That's something to keep in mind. I see a little retaining wall. That might influence, you know, the infiltration or capacity. Um, so pick up on stuff like that. And then, you know, get your utilities located. Well, I've got a gas line going through here, so that's cutting out a lot of available space on this side. Um, so once you kind of get your, your area, then you can do a lot with shape and form. Um, and so this is, you know, an opportunity to get a lot of creative juices going. Um, most rain gardens are shooting for, in Lexington, we shoot for 1.6 inch 
rain event or less. That means about every time it, it rains 1.6 inches or less, that's kind of what we design for. Um, you'll see a lot of materials that you might design for a one inch rain event. And what that ties into is it's um, determining your capacity of your rain garden, trying to predict how much water is going to be coming into this basin. That'll help you size the basin that you need to build. Um, it's, this is not a replacement of stormwater systems um, or exi anything existing because we're going to have a four inch rain event. We're going to have a five inch rain event that's really going to just be too much for a rain garden to handle. Um, you want to watch for sediment, soil, debris, anything like that that might wash into the rain garden. Um, make sure areas like, you know, bare areas are, are pretty well vegetated and stabilized. And you want to dissipate the energy of that water coming in. Uh, this is a rain garden I built out in Winchester this summer. Um, I guess it was in uh, June when we had a couple big rain events and I got everything looking pretty. I had the mulch all smoothed out in the rocks and this big old, you know, like a three inch rain event came in and uh, really nailed it. But um, it, it, worked out, it worked out pretty well. I had some decorative stone in here um, to allow it to convey that water. You probably want to use something like stone where you're gonna have a flow way or, or flow path if you've got a lot of water coming in. Um, pine bark or fresh wood chips are probably gonna float. Um, so you might wanna get you know, shredded hardwood mulch on your edges and things like that, but I like to use some of this gravel, decorative pebbles and things like that. Um, but you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, this is just another downspout, a little small rain garden and just, just having fun with different materials. Um, dry stack stone is a really good way to fortify your edges and get some good volume because that's still going to allow water to seep out and that's very Central Kentucky aesthetic. Uh, this is one, uh, a Coke bottle rain garden. So this is at Coca-Cola in Lexington. Um, that was a lot of fun to come up with that, um, work on that project. So this is what it looks like in its, in its glory. Um, I like to use blue stem, little blue stem. It's a pretty good border plant. Um, a lot of times when you're using native plants or natural looking plants, it's pretty good to have a good distinction between what's going to be mowed and what's not going to be mowed. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of experiences in, in <laughs> people mowing where they shouldn't or, or not mowing enough, but uh, I think it's good to have a visual delineation between what I want to be a little bit more wild and wooly uh, and what can be mowed once a week. So we took this same idea and uh, concept and did another rain garden in Wichita, Kansas. So this is about a three quarter acre uh, rain garden, again, for Coca-Cola. It's not a Pepsi bottle, it's Coca-Cola. <laughs> um, out there, and, and so this is kind of, you know, on an industrial scale or commercial scale, all of this uh, facility drains down a little swale and goes into their rain garden out there. And, and this is what it looks like. So this was um, seeded with some um, Kansas prairie uh, seeds, some grasses and wildflowers, and we used some local sandstone um, as our borders, border blocks. So it's good to have something that a mower can see and don't want to drive over um, as your border that keeps mowers on one side and not the other. Uh, so this is going back to the Owensboro uh, little house. Um, again, kind of I knew what kind of surface area I had to work with. Um, I could get a variety of, you know, different geometries to meet the, the volume I wanted to do. Um, so with the, the dimensions that worked out best for this location was this about 9.3 feet by 10 feet by 6 inches deep. Um, that gave me enough room. Um, and again, kind of looking at the crawl space, the curb, and um, also just knowing that I didn't want to build right up to asphalt. I didn't want to build right up to a road. I didn't want to put anything too close to where someone might uh, drive or slide into a rain garden. Um, but look around also kind of in what else might be influencing a rain garden. So I wasn't looking at just this downspout right here. 
um, had to pay attention to, well, I've got a big street right over here. So that's going to be putting a lot of water into the general area of my rain garden. Um, but again, um, going back to the um, gas line, that really had to neck it down. Sometimes you're just not going to be able to build a rain garden the size that you want it, especially in like an urban or residential area. Space is just going to be really minimized. Um, so you don't always have the opportunity to, to go as big as you want. But um, it's a good uh, volunteer event. So these were people, I did a workshop and just got people to come out and help plant. And so it is a neat way to get um, some community education, community ownership. Um, most of the time when you see information on rain gardens, you're gonna see uh, people promoting native plants. Generally, um, that's because the native plants have more established and, and deeper root systems. Um, and so the key is there is they can be a little more tolerant of both inundation, because they might be sitting in water for a day or more, and then you're gonna have periods of drought where they might be dry for a month or more. So rain gardens do have a little bit more of an extreme in terms of moisture coming in. Um, so this is a schematic of you know, some of the depth of some of these native plants. And I will say this is probably in a prairie uh, silt loam that has bedrock at maybe 30 feet down. So if you got bedrock at six foot, well, the roots are not gonna go through bedrock. You know? so, but this is just kind of an illustration of a lot of the depth of these native plants. There's actually a lot of biomass that's underground, not necessarily what you see on top of the surface. Um, and another thing, too, with the native plants is the, the relationships these plants have with our pollinators. So this is a monarch on a milkweed. How many people know the relationship between a monarch and milkweed? Any hands? Okay, yeah. So the monarchs lay their eggs on the milkweed. The milkweed produces a toxin that the uh, caterpillars can eat and so that's kind of one of the defenses that the caterpillars have whenever birds have. They've actually got a, a, a toxin in them. So that's something that they, uh, a relationship they've established over many years. And a lot of times I'll go back to when I'm looking at plant selection. So what does an area want to be? What, is it, what would it be if, if we weren't around? Um, you know, the, for the inner bluegrass, it was savannas or open woods. Um, so I think back to that too when I'm doing some plant selection. Um, I've got a bias that I'm more, I try to go more natural. So that's my bias, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going for more of the ecological aspects, um, not, just, um, not just for uh, aesthetics alone. Um, so there can be a lot of different types of looks. You know, some people might think this looks great and some people might think, no, this looks horrible. <laughs> Some people, especially if they grew up on a farm, they would consider half these things weeds because they had to deal with them when they were kids and pull them out. So it might not, the, the natives might not work for everybody all the time. Um, but there's a lot of different plants you can work with, and a lot of these are pretty common in, in the nursery trade. Yeah, little blue stems, black-eyed Susans, um, cardinal flower, blue lobelia, things like that, so they're not altogether uncommon or rare plants. Um, so this is a, a proud crew of a, of a brand new baby rain garden uh, in Lexington on uh, Southland Drive. So it's a curb cut rain garden inside of a parking lot. And again, you know, you build it and it rains, and that's kind of been some good luck for me. That happens after I build it. Um, but I think that's a great opportunity Whenever you get a rain garden built, go back, you know, look for those big rain days and, and go back and check on it because there might be stuff you need to adjust or tweak. Um, so maintenance, that's another big component. Um, if it's not raining, you might have to water your plants. Usually the native plants, they don't need a fertilizer. Um, you do want to keep your beds mulched. You want to retain that mulch, moisture. So that's pretty typical with other landscaping. Um, so what happens once you build a rain garden and uh, five years down the road, it's not getting taken care of or the owners, maybe they're not too interested in it. So the, we, I've, I've gone back with some volunteers and this was this spring cleaning out the same rain garden. The owner was like, ah, somebody else will take care of it. So we did. Um, but what worked really well in this rain garden, we have some um, 
Blue Star, that worked out really well. Um, we had some indigo, or blue false indigo. We've got some hibiscus in here and uh, some downy sunflowers. So I did a lot of variety in the rain garden, but those are the ones that have really bulked up and did really well. And, and so did Johnson grass. It did really well in a rain garden. Um, something you might want to consider that's a little bit different from rain gardens than other landscape beds is I've got a lot of area that's feeding to a rain garden. That's what it's supposed to do. So the potential for weeds, the potential for other things coming in is a little bit higher for a rain garden just because you're going to have a lot of constant inputs into this basin. So we had Johnson grass, we cut Johnson grass. So you will have to stay on top of it just like anything else. Um, but you can also, you know, take maintenance into to mind when you're doing design. Uh, we went back to Coca-Cola to do another rain garden. They said, this time, you know, can you do something a little more tame, a little more, uh, a little less wild and woolly. So we came up with a plan that's really relying on a lot of trees and shrubs. Uh, had a band of little blue stem in here, but just basically your trees and mulch. And it's going to work, and it's going to do the two things I need it to do for it to be called a rain garden. And again, so this is, you know, get it planted and get water in there. Um, so this is some service berry we had uh, in the spring, early spring. Um, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily look all that different, doesn't look all that wild and woolly. I tried some bulbs in there and on the drier areas, and they've, they've seemed to do okay. Um, you know, and I left the grasses up, you know, through the winter time, give it that Coca-Cola swoosh swipe type thing that, that they like. Um, yeah, and you know, red buds, so not necessarily unusual plants. It can still be pretty commonplace plants. Um, I don't have any more recent pictures of this rain garden because I don't want to show it. <laughs> We don't, we lost the maintenance contract for that a few years ago and it just does not look nearly as good. Um, but uh, it was an, a good uh, opportunity to do some education uh, when it was fresh. Uh, so I've got a few questions here. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to, to nod your head this way. Or nod your head this way. Get a little movement. Is this a rain garden? So these are the same place, looking from two directions. And so what we got is a long street coming down hill. We got a little stone area, some little dry stack stone, a little burn. Does that make it a rain garden? Looks like it just rained. Anyone? Yes, no. Uh, it is a rain garden because it does drain out. And again, I'm using that stack stone as a way to get my infiltration. I got a lot of woody material in here, so that soil is just like a big sponge. Um, now, it's not catching all the runoff. It's, it's just a little tiny thing compared with all the runoff that comes down that street, but it's something. Um, so this is another, right, oh, I just told you the answer. It is a ring ring. Um, this is a photographer, Betty Hall, uh, in Lexington. She loves taking pictures of butterflies, so she's got her milkweed and all kinds of good pollinator plants. And um, her rain garden starts over here on this kind of dry creek bed look. So this is piped about, probably about 100, 150 feet away from her house. So it's not right up next to the building, but it is down slope. So you don't have to have a rain garden, you know, right up next to the building. Uh, it could be on the back corner of her other property, and that's what she did here. Okay, how about this one? Is this a rain garden? My favorite answer is, I don't know. There's too many weeds in the way. <laughs> so this is a rain garden. Uh, the telltale sign is this little curb cut. So that's usually how in like parking lots or commercial areas, that's how you'd usually get the water in. This is a swale. And this is up in Madison, Wisconsin. And that's an area where they are very comfortable with prairie plants. They're very comfortable with tall grass prairie. So they don't mind things, they don't mind things getting over their ankles. You know, I know around here we, people tend to freak out if it's grass that tall, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's the aesthetic and that's the natural habitats for that area. So 
That's a rain garden. How about this one? No? Why not? Liner. <laughs> uh, so this is a stormwater basin of some, some sort. I've never seen one like it. Uh, I can only imagine that somebody had a good deal on pond liner or something, but I, I hadn't seen anything like that before. But no, it's not intended to let water through, but you do have plants in it. Um, so that's kind of not, not a rain garden. How about this one? No? No, it's not really, it's got water in it. This is intended to be a stormwater retention pond. Uh, so it was built, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to incorporate some stormwater management. This is a, a newer building, so, that, you know, they're, they're working the incorporating stormwater and, and runoff and how much comes off of a property. But it's designed to store water, um, thus the, the, the packed clay. And, uh, you know, these steep banks, so they're really trying to squeeze a lot of storage on, on their lot without letting it leave. Um, but no, not really a rain garden. How about this one? Anyone? Anybody recognize this? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so this is at Spring House Gardens. This is a um, rain garden in their parking area, obviously, with the car. <laughs> so you can do rain gardens. It doesn't have to be off of a downspout. Um, parking lots are great spots um, for doing little rain gardens. And they've got a big variety of stuff in here. And it's, it's pretty neat just to see what kind of combinations of plants you can grow together. Um, because you might have stuff that you think just wants to be dry or just wants to be wet and you can throw stuff in there and they, they get along. So it's pretty interesting. Um, how about this one? See some, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's, it's supposed to be a rain garden. We see a little inlet, a beehive inlet. So instead of a flat grate, this is a rounded grate and um, that's a really good idea to have on a stormwater basin or a rain garden basin like that. It prevents what if you, in the fall, when you get leaves accumulating, instead of it covering up a flat surface, it's a lot harder for leaves and everything to, to block a pipe with a beehive grate. So if you do a rain garden and you have a, an overflow pipe, a beehive grate's a good thing to have. Um, so this is in Idle Hour Park in Lexington. This is um, a pretty new planting. Is anybody here involved with, with this project? Okay, didn't know. Um, so right about here, something to think about and something to watch out for if you're doing these things, especially if you're working in one place with a lot of different contractors. Okay, who's responsible for the bobcat going through the rain guard? Um, there, you can have a lot of fingers pointed, but something to keep in mind is this, this works really well when it's very fluffy, loose, amended soils. So it is pretty easy to get equipment hung up in rain gardens. Um, typically, you want to do work from the outside, you know, with a backhoe or anything like that, and, and try not to get equipment into a rain garden um, as much as you can. Um, so what about this? Is this a rain garden? No. It says it is on the plans. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's holding water. You can, you know, see from the algae and everything. Um, not a lot of plants, but I, I, I don't want to pick on what's going on here too much because my assumption is that this is being used currently as a stormwater basin when they're doing construction. Um, and then it might be worked or amended somehow to become a rain garden or bioinfiltration when they get done with construction. But as you can imagine, doing these things, doing these rain gardens, it's pretty important to have, you know, protected soils um, upstream and, and, you know, when, when the parking lot's getting paved, um, things like that, you might not want some of that <coughs> fresh, hot tar um, influencing what's going on in your, in your planting. So if you can, try and save doing all your, your rain garden planting and stuff like that till other influences are, are, are not going to damage some of your rain garden stuff. Uh, okay, how about this one? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is in Lexington. This is in uh, a park, Castlewood Park. It's an old historic site, so 
or historic building. Um, so we used a uh, downspout um, over here and it's piped into the rain garden. So this is a little basin with, with the native plants. And this one too, but so here's the question. All right, so you got a pretty little basin. What does that mean? If we think back to, back to the water quality, you know, what are we trying to do these rain gardens for? Why is this important to do? How do we know if it's working? Um, so I'm gonna go through a little bit of a, a study I did um, at a school in Lexington. Um, they were doing some renovation works and um, I was doing a feasibility study. So just trying to figure out if they were to do some green infrastructure for different stormwater BNPs, um, where that could come into play and how effective would these things be. Um, so I was looking at the surface type. You know, is it a rooftop? Is it a road? Is it a sidewalk? Is it a lawn? Is it a driveway? Um, I was able to come up with a square footage of impervious surface coming in. Um, I collected some information about how much an estimated annual pollutant load would be coming in for different um, water quality pollutants. Uh, you can find some effectiveness. Um, there's some good databases from the US EPA or International Stormwater BMP database um, with some averages, kind of national averages on, on how well do these different types of BMP, stormwater practices, how well do they work. Um, and then I looked at the water quality volume. So how much of a certain area can this rain garden hold? I gave that as a percentage. Um, then I could come up with, okay, if I've got a certain drainage area, a certain type, a certain amount of runoff, a certain capacity, a certain effectiveness, I could kind of boil down this, you know, what kind of pollutant would I be, would the rain garden be capturing in a year? And I compared that with, okay, how much is this rain garden gonna cost? How much does it cost to design, install, and maintain? And I got a 20 year life cycle cost for a rain garden. So basically kind of boiling this down to how much does it cost for me to remove one pound of sediment a year? So this is going back to why are rain gardens important? Are they effective? So this is kind of the, the, the table I came up with evaluating these different BMPs. Um, so for like a rain garden, this is one of a, a few different ones for the site. This particular one was really only going to be able to, to treat about 50% of the drainage area coming into it. The drainage area was um, parking lot. It's right over in here. So over this, you know, thinking about a prorated annual cost, what is that going to cost for me to reduce or reduce one pound of sediment a year over 20 years? So why is that important? So I evaluated these different BNPs and came up with this kind of this cost analysis. Um, and I'm kind of lumping together rain garden, bioswale, um, bioretention basin. They're all pretty much going to work the same way. They might have a different name, but essentially going to function the same way. And the key thing being that you might have a rain garden or bioswale that might not be big. It might not be able to do as much as it could do or could handle, but what's important is the surface that's draining to it. Think about, um, you know, a lot of people want to do rain gardens by a downspout on their home, okay? What kind of water quality improvement would you have? If it's, you know, water coming from a downspout that's rain, so what, what kind of pollutants are we gonna have on top of a roof? Maybe bird poop, maybe something from the shingles, but not really all that much. I mean, it's by and large rainwater versus a parking lot. What would you have on a parking lot that you don't want to drink? You might have cigarette butts, you might have oils, grease, asphalt, you know, things like that coming off. Uh, salts in the wintertime, fertilizer that gets kicked off uh, when, you know, we apply fertilizer to the to the turf. So it's a big difference and not 
in, in, in the type of surface area that's feeding to your rain garden. So that's kind of why I'm going through this too, is just kind of illustrate this point that um, if you want to do a rain garden at a downspout, that's fine. But if you can find an opportunity to do something, to do a round spout, to do a rain garden that's fed from a parking lot or a street or a road, that's going to, be have, it's going to have a greater effect um, in terms of water quality. Um, yeah, so just kind of keep that in mind too, that these different surfaces are going to have um, um, different effects. So a less effective BMP or less effective rain garden with a high pollutant load is going to be a better value than a very effective BMP that's just getting roof runoff or something like that. So something to keep in mind when you're doing locations. And why is this all important? Um, just keeping in mind what's, what's in the watershed, what kind of water you're dealing with. The ultimate goal is we want to help fix our creeks, um, reducing some of the erosion and scour that's produced by all this impervious area. So think back to as the communities have been developed and what effect that's had on our local waterways. That's what we're wanting to do with these rain gardens. Or, or one thing, that's, that's kind of my take. If, if you get hired to do something just to make it look good, go for it. You know, that's great too. Um, if you get hired to do a rain garden just for pollinators, go for it, that's great. Um, but I try and keep in mind that there's, there's a water quality aspect to this. Um, so that's it. Um, any questions?